if you have any. Perfect. Um, just unshare your screen. Okay. I have one quick, I have a question. Um, I know there were a lot of changes, you know, to the tax code um, that I think are probably tripping up some business owners now, particularly deductions. What did you see were like the top two changes to the tax code that have tripped up um, business owners, particularly small business owners um, in the last from, tax season? From the, uh, the new tax cuts, like um, pre-2017, when the the Trump tax cuts, when they sort of changed the tax code, okay. they changed the deductions, they changed yeah. a lot of the structure, and there was so, all these conversations about how that would impact business owners, particularly small business owners. Yes. So um, I'm not sure. I'm, I'm trying to think of two. I know one that was just really major was the meals and entertainment, because that entertainment piece kind of went away. And then... Um, so that was one that everyone is like, oh my gosh, I can't believe. And, and then it was more uh, pieced out like 50% meals, 80% meals, what could be 100% meals, things like that. So that meals and entertainment piece, because the entertainment um, pretty much went away, that tripped up a lot of businesses as well as for the, not so much the small business owner, but for the larger companies who would... Um, reimburse their employees for certain expenses, but now there is no unreimbursed employee expenses anymore on the Schedule A where you could itemize. That hurt a lot of people as well because a lot of employees were paying for some of their business expenses and they would get a portion reimbursed from their employer. <coughs> Excuse me. And then the rest they would write off on their taxes and that couldn't happen this year uh, after the new Trump taxes. Right, right. Okay. And I, I have a question. Can you hear me? Yes. Uh -huh. Okay. What, uh, because I, I've seen them, but I've never had to deal with them. What are excise taxes? So typically when you have um, excise taxes, think of like, um, for the most part, think of the trucking industry. Mm. Anytime you have the yeah the commerce um, going back and forth, shipping things, um, transporting things, those are the guys that typically have those excise taxes imposed. Hi, I've got a question too. Delores, uh -huh. thank you so much for that presentation. I uh, I found it so clear and uh, compassionate and helpful. That's really terrific. Um, my question is, I'm in California, and um, I'm wondering how, I, you know, I, I know the IRS isn't state specific, but in terms of our own franchise tax boards, is that something you can help with too, or is that something you would want to refer out? So you're right. So California, and I have colleagues across the country, and California, we call California the devil. So <laughs> when we, we do. So it all depends on the amount um, of the tax debt that I deal with the FTB there. Um, most of the times I will either partner with one of my um, fellow enrolled agents or um, sometimes even an attorney to assist with the FTB if it gets to be something that's like big. Um, but most of the times it's okay. I can, you know, handle it. But when, when I can't handle it, I get someone else to help me tackle the devil. <laughs> that, that's fair enough. Okay. That makes a lot of sense. Thanks. Any other questions? I know we've got a couple of folks on the phone. I have one. Uh, thanks, Deltrice, for the presentation. Um, my question is, what would you consider uh, would be important for someone that just started um, a business? What should they take in, like the number one thing they should take into consideration as far as taxes go? Oh, yeah, definitely. So um, I, I don't know what would be number one. Let me just wrap off a few. Make sure and know your business structure. Make sure that you are separating your business 
income from your personal income. So get a business checking account. I don't care if you just made $10, don't put that $10 into your personal bank account. Make sure you get a federal ID number. Make sure you understand if you're hiring people, make sure to know the difference between employees that will have a W-2 versus a, an, an independent contractor. So those are some things that, that come to mind. And, and you want to track your income and expenses. It's just, it doesn't have to be on some elaborate bookkeeping system. It doesn't have to be QuickBooks or anything. But even if you just had an Excel spreadsheet where you're documenting your income and your expenses, do that. So those are the things that I think are important for someone that's just starting out. You just made me so happy Thank you. when you said that difference between employees <laughs> and independent contractors. Just so you know, I had a, I had a little moment. <laughs> Glad yeah. I could make you happy. <laughs> yes, I was just thinking that is what we preach. <laughs> that and and separate accounts. Don't commingle the fun. Oh. Don't commingle the fun. That's right. And such joy to my soul. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> Oh, wow. Anybody else? I have one more. So um, what are some practical sort of strategies that people can use um, to, and when they're starting out to kind of um, keep themselves out of that trouble? I've heard theories of setting up a separate tax um, bank account so that you are consistently, every time dollars come in, you know, weekly, monthly, quarterly, moving money to that account so that you can be accumulating money to pay the taxes. Some people try to keep track of it separately. Ultimately, what do you recommend is one of the most sort of practical ways that will really help people and habit that they can, you know, consistently get in to um, set those funds aside? Because I think it's, it's part of the problem I think business owners have, and we have, is both the discipline to set aside the money. And when you're first building the business, you're like, well, I need every dollar to live on. How am I going to set aside 20%, 30% of this when I'm not even making enough yet to pay all the bills? How do I set something aside? So what's a good you know, practical way to get yourself into that, that habit? So you just said it. It's, it's about discipline. Um, and then the thought like this is, it's not impossible, but it is hard to do. People should look at their businesses in chunks of time. So think about looking at it each quarter. This is where my income is for the quarter. This is where my expenses are for the quarter. And then they can start to see how much they need to set aside. It's almost like like we um, we offer a tax withholding service, and that service we do it quarterly. But we're we're actually doing a tax return each quarter for our small business owners because they need to know what their tax liability is, and not like now instead of getting the surprise at the end of the year. So having the discipline to because you can't just set um. Setting aside 20% of your income, that's not going to do the trick because you do have expenses. Now you have this big pot of money growing and you don't really need all of it for taxes where you probably could have used it, you know, throughout the year or throughout the days or months or whatever. So it is about disciplining yourself. And I already know it's hard because there, I, I am the first to say I have skipped. I'll do mine six months. I might do mine nine months. And I'm like, okay, oh, I'm looking at this profit and loss statement. I think I could gauge it from there. And then I get the surprise at the ninth month. I'm like, I missed the mark. Um, but the, the key is to just, you just have to do it. You have to discipline yourself and get it done. It's hard. You're going to miss the mark. Um, but I think it's going to be unfair. I know I like to keep as much of my money as possible throughout the year. And if I see 20% going into this fund that's not the Del Trace Hart Anderson fund, that's my personal account. 
if I see that money just growing in that bank account, then I might want to use it. You might want to put it in and, and again, still 20% of your off the top, like off the gross, I still wouldn't do. I would actually do the, the record keeping to know how much I really need to put into that fund. But once the money is there, if you can discipline yourself to do that, once the money is, is there or once you accumulate that money, I would move the money to an account that you can't get to easily. For instance, both of my banks are less than one bank I could walk to from my office. Actually, both of them I could walk to if I was healthier, but one I could certainly walk to. Um, that's not the bank that you want to be able to keep your money in because you don't want to be able to go and, and, and take money out. You don't want a checking account to be where you keep that money. You want a savings that, you know, maybe you have the little booklet with the withdrawal slips. And I know, you, you know, that, like, yeah, you want to have that where you, you just put those in a safe and you don't have those anymore. And I do know that you can go to the bank and, you know, get a withdrawal slip or whatever, but maybe an online bank where you just don't have as much access or a bank that you have to kind of travel a little distance for that particular account. Um, yeah. But there again, it just takes discipline and yeah, it, and it's, it's not always there. It's not I always. Know, I know um, some of my larger clients, um, actually all of my larger clients um, have the operating account for the regular, and then they have the payroll account and they sweep, they sweep payroll and taxes and so on into that one. But they do, act, I mean, payroll taxes and so on into that one. They do actually pay their estimated quarterly payments out of their regular one. Mm -hmm. But again, it's a large, you know, they're larger enterprises. Um, yeah. But yeah. And, and, and that's great if they can manage it. I have clients that overwhelms them. Mm -hmm. So they like to see all of their funds in one place. They'll have one checking and one savings and nothing else. But then I have a lot of my trucking clients. They'll have a maintenance account. They'll have a tax account. They'll have their operating account and their payroll account, all checking accounts. And then they'll have a savings account. So it just all depends on, um, yeah, if it's not going to overwhelm the the taxpayer, then they can do that. But um, if it is going to overwhelm them, yeah, just have one or two, have one checking in the savings. Um, and I wanted to piggyback on what you said about the, the management of that. Because one thing I, I'm a big believer of is monthly financial statements. I mean, I stress that all the time. So many businesses wait. And if you look at your financial statements, if you prepare them on a monthly basis, then you see what your profit is. And if your profit is large, then you know that you need to start making estimated quarterly payments mm -hmm. and be very judicious about making them. Um, because if you have an estimated quarterly payment of let's say $20,000 and you wait, then you're going to get, then that amount is going to be even larger and larger and you're not going to, and, and if you're, if you're not being fiscally responsible or if, or if something else somewhere requires that, that money and you didn't plan for it, like you have to buy a truck that you're going to depreciate, but you're paying cash. So your income statement only shows a portion of the cost of that truck but you but out of your pocket you have to pay for the whole truck then you're in trouble so um i think that uh so anyway that i'm, I'm looking at my notes here and then the other thing was it, as i said it helps you identify when you're how much money you need to pay in taxes and then you can employ tax mitigation strategies you know you can confer with someone like you um and say, I'm not sure, or, you know, you're a regular accountant, but honestly, I don't think a lot of accountants are really that great at tax strategies. In my, in my experience, they suck. Um, I mean, I'm not even a tax accountant and I'm like, 
you could deduct this and you could deduct that and you could deduct this and you, you know, and they're like, well, I wasn't aware of all of those things. Like we need to get you to talk to a, um, to a tax, to a real tax accountant. Um, but yeah, so you can practice tax mitigation strategies if you're thinking you're going to have a very large tax bill. And the other thing is, I also say you need to look at the end of your fiscal year that last that 12th month. So if it's, if your calendar year is the fiscal year, then December 1st, for, look at where you are for the 11th month and see how much you owe. Did you, are you far exceeding your quarterly tax payments? Do you, what can you do? Maybe you can, you can, you know, you can accelerate the purchase of some equipment or you can do different things, but then you need to talk to someone like Del Trees about what you can do in order to ensure you don't have a, a big tax issue um, later. But if you do these things, you can plan and you can take care of it before the end of the year, instead of trying to play catch up and take care of that huge tax bill or the issues that it's now caused because you don't have the money to pay that huge tax bill months down the line. So that's my last thing. And the last, the last thing I say is the 12 cash flow, folks, cash flow. In addition to the financial statement, forecast out your cash flow. Um, I'm just so happy that you're here because these are the things that I stress. And I'm like, these are, this is one of the reasons why you need to do it. If you have a 12 week cash flow forecast that you can see when your estimated taxes are due and how much it's going to be on whether or not you have the cash to pay it. You can also on an installment agreement. You can put that in whatever. And if you're, if you're starting to feel like, oh my gosh, I don't know I'm going to do this, then that's when you reach out to somebody like you, Deltri, mm -hmm. and and say, I need, I need help. I'm trying to figure this out. Um, but you, you're doing that before it's due instead of after it's due or two days before. <laughs> right. Yeah. 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 No one likes that surprise at the end of the year. And and we as accountants, we don't like to give you that surprise at the end of the year. <laughs> Yeah, uh, tax bills. Um, yeah, they make grown men cry. Let me just say. And I think to piggyback with just you know a couple on the the legal side of advice. First and foremost, it is it is very important that once you are in your business and you're looking to have something beyond simply a hobby that makes you a little money on the side and it's truly your your day job and it's truly your focus and it's truly the bulk of your income that you have a relationship with a real tax professional as, as tiffany's saying that will help you think strategically about your taxes in advance and not simply the cousin that does taxes during you know tax season um because there is a big difference between thinking ahead, how you classify things, um, how you manage that cash flow, when you might take on an expense um, that can impact your tax liability, how you structure things, whether you loan money to your business, whether it's a capital contribution to your business, whether it's a reimbursable expense from your business. There are different tax implications, and particularly for those of us who have LLCs, where for the most part, what you're doing is a pass-through taxation, where your, your business files a tax return, but you're actually going to report your, um, your disbursement, you're going to import, report your income on your tax return. And so understanding how those business expenses versus your income and profits work. And so having a knowledgeable person and not just the good good buddy that did your taxes when you know you were just on your own um, working at a job and you're just giving them your W twos. It's it's important to understand having a tax strategy versus just someone that files a tax return for you. Um, the other thing I would always advise folks is it is important to not bury your head in the sand. You know, I'm sure you see a lot of times where people come to you when the government is about to levy <laughs> their property or garnish their bank accounts or force a sale of property, or they're a week before closing on the house that they wanna sell and the purchase price is less than the liens that are on the property and they're trying to figure out what to do. 
And so, you know, the IRS doesn't come out of the blue. They don't jump out at you while you're out walking down the street. They send a lot of communications, a lot of notices, a lot of heads up, um, where at each stage you can resolve an issue, you can get a CNC, you can get on a payment plan, you can offer that compromise, um, and we'll communicate with you. But if you ignore those notices, you ignore the situation, it doesn't go away. <laughs> That's when they jump out of the bushes with a garnishment and your bank account is frozen. <laughs> but that doesn't come out of the blue. That usually comes after a long time. And, and, and people, unfortunately, um, suffer kind of from that ostrich. They want to bury their head. They want to just ignore it. And then it becomes a huge emergency. Um, and then it's really impacting their lives and impacting their business. So seek out professionals early on. Face it head on because then it's usually something that is easier to resolve, less expensive to resolve and easier to resolve if you, you do it, if you do it earlier. Um, on that same, sorry, go ahead. So I was, I was gonna ask Bill Tree, so what, what, um, what percentage of the people who contact you had, have basically ignored most of the IRS, um, you know, the IRS notices versus those that, you know, are contacting you on the first or second notice? So um, the nasty grams, that's what I call those letters. Like the, we're, we are about to do something because just like Roxanne said that, yeah, they come out of the bushes. I, I have to use that at some point, Roxanne. I, that was funny. Yeah. they. I might have like, to trademark it and license it to you because you know. <laughs> okay. Okay. <laughs> yeah. They, the the letters that um where they come out of the bushes um those that's where i get almost 90 i would say 99 percent of the people wow. that i that i assist because people just don't like to face it up front or they've been putting it off putting it off so either they're at the point where the irs has given them that last letter that final notice letter or sometimes even worse. Um, and, and one thing that Roxanne said is true because I, I help a lot of real estate agents or a lot of real estate brokers, um, real, the real estate industry. You're right. When they, it's time to sell that house and that lien is on that house, they cannot sell that house. Or sometimes even when they want to buy a house and then they are in tax trouble. They cannot do that. So what happens is they can't close in a month. They may have to wait for three months. And sometimes the deals fall through. But, you know, someone else wants to buy that house or someone else, you know, someone else is ready to sell the house. So a deal can fall through because of that. So the real estate, yeah, you can't wait. You, if, if you want to buy real estate and you know you have tax issues, address it like at least three to four months ahead of time because it takes that long and it's COVID right now. So it may even take longer to get any lien subordinations or lien releases. Now, back to uh, Tiffany with your question. Yeah, I it, it's over 90%. I, I honestly think it's 99% because another thing that'll happen is people won't even come with the letters. They'll call and say, the IRS just froze my bank account. They are, and, and you're right, Roxanne, they, they already received because the, the, the bank is notified by the IRS, right? And the IRS is even, even when they freeze that account, they're only freezing for that day. And then, but people don't know that they have 20 days to actually get to work out whatever or negotiate with the IRS. But I have people come to me on that day. The IRS has frozen my bank account or the IRS, I just got my paycheck and it's half of what I should have received. The IRS has garnished. So they've ignored all of the letters. And what do you think is the biggest reason for that? Is it a, a, a feeling of, I mean, is it fear? Is it shame? Like it's, with, it's a combination. Some people are fearful. Some people are ashamed. Some people don't even know where to begin. Some people are in denial. So it just it just all depends. Yeah. 
it's almost like yeah it's it could be all of the above or any of the above but and yeah. and that's why I, I try to talk to um as many people as i can because this is nothing to be ashamed of it can happen to anybody it has happened to more people than people probably care to admit and you can fix the problem the problem can be fixed I think it's also important when you do, when you, I think some people also trust other folks to take care of things. That's where you can end up with the bookkeeper has absconded with the funds, the entity that was supposed to turn in your sales tax or turn in, you pay your payroll, that money found its way into their pocket versus, versus your pocket. And so also some strategies that you can use to mitigate those situations. Um, if you have employees that are handling your accounting um, in addition to, you know, monitoring them on, on, a, on a certain level of regular basis or having a process by which any transactions over a certain amount, you have to sign off on them and then you double check those records. You can also obtain um, employee fraud insurance. This can assist you if you have a situation where an employee does steal from you, hides profits, a lot of oftentimes celebrities, you'll see they will end up in those situations where the business manager or the accountant that they were trusting to handle things did not pay the taxes. And the reality is whether or not that person is being nefarious, you're still liable to the IRS. The IRS is like, so sad, that's so sorry. So anyway, you owe us X. <laughs> and so having some... If they're an employee, you can have employee fraud insurance that can help cover cover those losses and, and, and cover those issues. Um, if they're not an employee and you're utilizing a company or utilizing an independent contractor, you'll wanna make sure that in your written agreement with them, ding, ding, written agreement, that mm -hmm. there is an indemnity provision, um, possibly a warranty for their work and for professionals, making sure that they have insurance errors and omissions insurance, um, other types of general commercial liability insurance, so that you've got a, a place that you can possibly go for, to remedy those damages and for funds to remedy those damages. Um, because even if you know someone else does it, if they're acting in your name and on your behalf, then you're ultimately still liable to the IRS. And so this gives you some recourse on the back end, um, but you'll still have to square things with with the government. Uncle Sam's like, that is such a shame. So here's the bill. Here's the interest. Here are the penalties. What are we going to do? So those are a couple legal strategies you can you want to think about to protect yourself in those situations as well. And um, and you're absolutely right, Roxanne. Um, there are times when taxpayers can prove that they relied on someone else and that person ends up having um, the burden shift to them, but it's few and far between. It was, you know, Deltrice, when you mentioned the, that they can track down your contractor, um, I, I, I worked at a, at a, uh, a nonprofit, a real estate focused nonprofit, and one of the entities that we um, actually, we provided housing to veterans and um, newly released, formerly incarcerated individuals. And and I got a call because I was a COO and CFO. I got a call, I, I got a notice in the mail from the IRS. And it's like, who is this? This is not an employee, but it was someone who had, who owned a fourplex that we had apartments um, mm -hmm. at. And, and yeah, the IRS were gar garnishing his 1099. Yeah. So, I, I helped him. He basically had done, like you said, he had he had ignored all of the notices that came in the mail. And so when I called him, I said, all you have to do is contact contact them. And um, and fortunately, he didn't owe a whole lot, but he, so he was able to just do a plain vanilla installment agreement. But yeah, and I think, and I was thinking, um, and oh, by the way, there were a lot of employees at that pl at the place. I was like, "What the heck is going on? All these people have all these 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 these." I'm sorry, it was just all these employees at the same time. But I realized it was yeah, it was 
it was shame. They were afraid, like you said, um, and I took notes. Fearful. Some were ashamed. Others just didn't know. Like, I don't know how to do this. Do I? I don't have this lump sum of money. What do I do? Um, and then the other one was, um, yeah. And then I guess just denial. The as you said, um, right then the head in the sand, the head in the sand. But they, so so, what would you say? If, what would you say to the person who? gets one of those notices in the mail, like the first notice, and you know, the reaction is, because I've had them before, the, when you get it and it's like, oh crap, and then it's like, calm down. But yeah, the first reaction is, oh crap. <laughs> yeah. what, would you, what would you say the next reaction? <laughs> or the, yeah. next reaction? The, the next reaction, because a lot of times people don't even open the letters. That That's another thing. I, I promise you, I've, I've had a few clients that have come and said, here, I've received this, these letters. I can't open them. So the, the next thing is to open the letter and read the letter. And if you can't understand the letter, then you go and you seek help immediately because you're right. It's if you address it, the earlier you address it, the less expensive it is less expensive in penalties and interest, less expensive for a professional to assist you with the issue. And keep in mind, there are only three professionals on this earth, the universe, that can assist you legally with your tax issues, that can represent you before the IRS. That is the IRS enrolled agents, a CPA, or an attorney. Those are the only three. And then you have to think, they have to specialize in tax resolution work. If you go to a CPA and that CPA is only specializing in audits, then that's not your CPA to help you out. If you go to an attorney and that attorney practices family law, but knows nothing about tax law, that's not your person. The IRS enrolled agents have the most training, the most testing and experience with, and, and even with the enrolled, the IRS enrolled agents, some of them practice more tax preparation or tax planning than they do tax resolution. So you have to find that one of the three professionals and you have to ask them, do you specialize in tax resolution? Some people call it tax resolution or tax controversy. But yeah, tackle it early on, open the letters and address it. If you don't understand the letter, just get a consultation to understand what the letter is. That might be all you need to do it yourself. And if you can't do it yourself, is no shame in not being able to do it yourself. Get help, seek help early. The earlier you seek the help, the less expensive it will be. And I will say when, you know, particularly now, I mean, you can get a long wait time sometimes, but I do feel like the IRS does really try to provide guidance and helpful information, um, their bulletins, their 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 forms to try to explain things, even the helpline when I've had to call, you know, if you can sit and wait on hold or get an appointment to speak to someone, I, I have I my experience has been that they are helpful and that you can get a fair amount of good information online as well, at least an initial start to understand some of the terms, some of the forms, what are they asking for? Because you can be overwhelmed by the different types of forms and and all the numbers and initials. And um, so I do think, you know, go there, see what the information is there as well, because there's power in just educating yourself and, and facing it. So here's the thing. If you call the IRS three different times, you may get three different answers, especially when you don't know or understand the law yourself. Um, so, yes, I would suggest. Um, 
I, I could see someone going and reading because sometimes the IRS doesn't even know what's on their own website. Like the person that you speak to, they may not know, they may not have the updates. And then sometimes the IRS has not updated the website. So you still may, depending on how severe your situation is, you still may just want to get that one consultation. Even if you don't do the whole, res don't allow the professional to do the whole resolution, you just want to get at least that one consultation. Um, another thing with that, I had one other thought with, oh, you, the IRS's goal is to collect as much money as possible. So those, the ones that you get that may be knowledgeable on the phone, once you do get them, they still may not tell you everything. They, their goal that all they're supposed to do is to collect the money. So they may not tell you, oh, you may have penalties or interest that can be abated. They may not tell you that. Or they may say, well, yeah, we will abate this penalty. But you may not even want that a particular penalty abated because it might be a penalty abatement of $100 where if you are doing certain things, you may have an abatement, uh, you may have a penalty two or three months from now that's $1,000. So don't you don't want the, the abatement that they're going to give you. You want one that you know that's coming down the pipe. So you... You may benefit. It all depends on how much you owe. You may benefit from having a professional because remember, that's when I talked about having a strategy to attack your tax debt, that you want to have that strategy because they're just like if you're calling with help for tax preparation, they can only tell you so much. They're not going to tell you how to tax plan. They're going to assist you with putting the numbers on the on the tax form which is totally different. So that means they've collected more money from you than you should have paid them. So it just it just all depends. And, you know, Deltrees, I, I'm, I'm glad you said that because I think, you know, educated people, and I know I'm definitely a Googler and kind of a, a DIYer and a, and a bunch of things. I think that sometimes it just, it's just more expedient and in the end cheaper to find someone who can help you. And then the thing then is, but the thing there is, what if you don't know anyone, you know, if you, if you don't know anyone, but how do you, how do you get to that? But yeah, if you can find someone to talk to, um, because I actually had a situation years ago. Um, I had a business that I shut down and then I had, um, so I had some losses, but because of the way I had the business had been structured. I couldn't because I had it as a C corp. I couldn't claim all the losses all at once. Anyway, a number of different things. So I had this. I had a large tax bill, and I couldn't pay it at that time. Well, I talked to the nice IRS agent, <laughs> and he said, "Okay, we're we're going to we're going to put a hold on it. You don't owe anything." until and we'll check back in six months or a year or something like that we'll, and, and see and and you know and then we can talk about an installment agreement i was like wow superb all taken care of and then i got a notice in the mail for a lien just a blanket lien that said if i so if i were to acquire something or get a bunch of money then just to make sure that they've protected themselves and i said what the heck I, 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 I would have preferred to have worked something out and entered into an installment agreement because I did have some money. I just didn't have the, um, the amount that they said, but he had so nicely said, well, you don't have to pay anything. We'll just place it on hold. Yes, right. we'll place it on hold, but put a big tax lien, a yes. <laughs> tax lien that's on public record. So yes, I, um, I mean, I got, I, I ultimately got it resolved, but it was like, why did I even have to go there? But he was so helpful. <laughs> and, and that's the thing. When no, we, no, no. Yeah, with <laughs> consulting with a professional, yeah. they could give you your options. So the, it would have been the professional's responsibility to say, because basically what you just mentioned is the currently non-collectible. So they put you in CNC 
And because based on the amount of debt that you had, they placed a lien with the county, a notice, yeah, of a public lien, right, for, for all the world to see. Um, so they did that. But a lot of people are like, well, no, had I known, just like you said, had you known it was going to be a lien, you would have tried to pay something. So you could have gone a different route and paid something on it and avoid the lien altogether. Or you could have paid down the debt a little bit if you had, you know, a little bit of money to avoid having the lien. But they're not going to give you those options because they're not trained to give you those. But a lot, and I can't say all of them aren't trained, but most of them you're not going to get that from. So just getting the, just having someone to do a consultation. Now to answer your question about, um, like if you don't know anyone, where to, if you know, you can always go to the IRS's website and on their website, they will have um, a listing of who all is um, is registered. So they'll have a listing of all enrolled agents, all attorneys and all CPAs who have registered with the IRS. So you can look for, if you want someone in your city, your state, um, and there again, a lot of people, and I guess this is how I always end up with people that are outside of my state, even though I get a good bit of work from South Carolina, but most of my clientele are from out of South Carolina are not from South Carolina because people are embarrassed. People don't want, you know, the local people in their business. So you can go by state and sort and, and find someone to assist you. Um, Another place, there is um, what's called the National Association of Enrolled Agents. You can go to their website, which is naea.org. Um, there are local for every um, national, um, each state has their own enrolled agent association. So in South Carolina, it's the South Carolina Society of Enrolled Agents. And Georgia has theirs, that, like all of them, um, all of the states have their own chapters of the National Association. Um, if you are looking for an, uh, a CPA, you can go to AICPA.org. So you can find someone and then you can look to see if they specialize in tax resolution. So there are ways. And then sometimes even your, um, your tax professional, if you have a tax professional and just let them know, and uh, hey, I have an issue. I know that you may not specialize in it, but can you assist me? Because I have partners, oh my gosh, a lot of partners that are tax professionals and they don't have the license that I have and they refer work to me all the time. I actually have partners that are CPAs and enrolled agents because they, they have the license to do the work. They just don't do the work. So I have those relationships. So either your tax professional will know or you can go to the IRS's website and pick somebody, anybody that's um, within those guidelines. So yeah, there are plenty of options, plenty of options for help. Does anyone else have any questions? I think that's it. You got to get that. Okay. Yes. Okay. Well, thank you so very much, Deltry. This has been amazing. I, I did put the link in there and I clicked on it to make sure that it worked. <laughs> um, and uh, it, this has just been really, really informative for me personally. And I know I've, I've seen the chat um, um, for the people on the con. I know that whomever watches this, Definitely. So thank you very, very much from, yes, thank you so very much. You're quite welcome. I enjoyed myself thoroughly. Again, sorry for the little uh, interruption. Pardon the interruption. <laughs> no, no worries. Look, I was, I had to, um, I called, I called to send a wire transfer and I'm talking now, you know, I, I have to send a wire transfer periodically. And I, I'm calling my bank and I'm talking to the woman and then I hear, <laughs> and then I hear another one. I'm like, oh my God.
is this some kind of fraud? You know, because all the real estate folks, the, the title, you know, the, the agents and the attorneys all warn you about fraud and wire transfers. And then I realized, oh, oh yeah, the back office is working from home. So don't worry. <laughs> don't worry about it. Don't worry about it at all. <laughs> yes. Okay. But thank you guys for having me. I really enjoyed it. Um, yeah, it was my pleasure to be here. So much fun. Wonderful. Well, thank you. This was our, you know, for our October Source Collective. Um, if anyone has suggestions on topics, please feel free to let Tiffany and I know, share information in the meetup group um, chat. We will, um, in the coming days, drop both a link for the video as well as a link for the slides and the presentation in the, um, I usually put them in a, in a Google Drive and send everyone the link so that they'll have access to it. And so we just want to thank you all, um, tell friends, tell your colleagues about the group, and uh, we will catch you next month. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Okay, bye-bye.